And so what I wanted to do with this book was to look at how the Western Front and the First World War looks if you look at it not through British eyes, as we normally do, but through German eyes, through the, the eyes of this chap, uh, Crown Prince Ruprecht. Uh, and, and, and when I did that, I found that you got a very different perspective, not only on how the war was fought and how the British Army comes across, but also you know, bigger issues about the First World War itself. So, for instance, I think you know, most people, or many people, I think, when they think of the First World War, they just think of this sort of sterile, sterile stalemate stuck in the trenches, think of, of sort of blundering generals forcing their men forwards into machine gun fire to allow them to, dry, to die in droves. And, uh, and of course, there's, there is some of that, some of that is true. It's not just a myth. But equally, one of the things I found was that there's a lot more change going on. Both sides are actually innovating at this frantic pace the whole way through the war. They're trying new things, they're trying new tactics, trying new weapons, they're integrating the most modern technologies. The, the aeroplane is an obvious example. It had only been invented 10 years before, uh, before the First World War, of course. Um, they're trying all these different things. It just so happens that all those things cancel out, and that's where the stalemate comes from. It's not because they're just standing there knocking seven bells out of each other the whole time. So that was, that was one thing that I, that I found came out of it that, that was interesting. The, the second thing that I thought was interesting that came out of it was that the way we look at the British Army, I think, changes. In, in the, the history, or in Britain, or in the Commonwealth anyway, the history of the First World War is very much written through British eyes, and it's all about the British Army did this, the British Army did that. And, and of course, the British Army was important. There's no, no question about that. But of course, the British Army had allies, most notably the French. And when you look at the situation from the German side, you get a very strong feeling of how, for most of the war, the French were actually a bigger threat to the Germans, or were seen as a bigger threat, than the British were, which I think is something that we often forget in, in this country, that we, there was an ally, uh, or allies that we were working with, the British were working with. And then the, the uh, and following on from that, you know, in, some, in a lot of the recent historiography, the military historians in particular have charted the way that the British Army ascends what they call a learning curve uh, over the course of the war, that they, they go from this early period of uh, a hugely expanded army facing horrendous challenges that, that, that almost comes to grief on the first day of the Battle of the Somme in, in 1916, which then has to learn a whole new way of, of working, uh, uh, which it manages to do by 1918 and then and defeats the German army. Well, when you look at it from the German perspective again, that learning curve is not as clear as it sometimes come out, it comes out if you just look at the British, the British sources. The learning that the British do seems a bit patchier. Uh, there, isn't, there are elements of the same mistakes being made all the way through the war. Uh, and, and, and the other side of this is that the German army looks much weaker than we have tend, than I think the popular perception tends to, to ascribe it to, to be. So to, we have to, I think, think about the German mistakes as well as the things that the British did right when you're looking at British and French did right when you're looking at explaining why the First World War played out the way it did.